Bennett certainly knew something about plural marriage because in his anti-Joseph Smith book, History of the Saints, he names several women as plural wives of Joseph, and they really were plural wives of Joseph. But he also portrays plural marriage in such a lurid and sensational way that he either is just blowing it all out of proportion or he didn't have a great understanding of what plural marriage was. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, we've got with us Matt Godfrey. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, so Matt is, uh, to, to we church history nerds, Matt is a, is a godlike figure. Uh, but I'm going to let you maybe tell us a little bit about your background um, occupationally and with church history and whatnot. Well, I come from the celestial kingdom, apparently. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. Uh, he is a translated being. <laughs> I've been really fortunate in my life to be able to uh, have some interesting opportunities, uh, both educationally and in the workplace. I have a PhD in American history and public history from Washington State University studying history. I did a lot with the sugar beet industry of the American West. And then I worked for several years as a historical consultant in Montana, where we would do a lot of projects for the federal government. I did that for about eight years, and it was a lot of fun. Um, but then an opportunity came up to work on the Joseph Smith Papers. I didn't have a, much of a background in Joseph Smith at the time. Most of my interest in church history focused on the 20th century, not the 19th century. But I understood how important the Joseph Smith Papers uh, project was. And so I've spent about 13 years on the project in various roles. I was the managing historian for eight years on the project from 2013 to 2021, which is just kind of a fancy way of saying that I kind of had oversight over all the historians that worked on the project. There's about 15 historians that we had. Uh, I also edited uh, several of the volumes in the document series. Um, I was the lead historian on documents 2, 4, and 7, and also contributed to volumes 10, 12, and 15. So that was a blast to be able to work on, on the actual volumes. And then I've served as a general editor on the project since 2015, uh, so about eight years. And that just means that I read through everything that we publish before it's published to make sure that the tone's right, that we are consistent in the way that we present things, that it doesn't sound like it's written by, you know, five different people, but that it kind of is a, a seamless, seamless book. So that's kind of what I've been doing over the last several years. So you know what you're talking about essentially. Maybe. 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 <laughs> That's uh, spoken like a true, humble researcher. So I was first introduced to you actually um, through your Fair Mormon conference address from several years ago. It's not called Fair Mormon anymore now. And you were talking about John C. Bennett. Yes. And that's actually what we're going to talk about today. I should have said that right at the beginning. We're talking about John C. Bennett today. A and my understanding is John C. Bennett is kind of a main amongst Latter-day Saints, he's kind of a, he's kind of the villain of Nauvoo, if we were to kind of stereotype him or categorize him. And I don't think we've talked about John C. Bennett at all on this channel that I'm aware of. So I'm really excited that you were able to come in to talk about him with us. Tell us a little bit about who he is and what role he plays in church history. Okay. Uh, John C. Bennett is definitely an interesting figure um, in church history. He comes on the scene in Nauvoo, uh, really in about 1840. So 1840, remember, Nauvoo's only been a settlement of the saints for about a year. And Joseph starts receiving letters from John C. Bennett, um, and Joseph thinks that he doesn't know who Bennett is. But actually, Joseph met John C. Bennett way back in 1832. Um hmm. John C. Bennett was a preacher at the time with uh, Alexander Campbell's religious movement. And William McClellan, uh, kind of another villain in Latter-day Saint history, but at the time he was uh, a member of the church, he introduced Joseph to John C. Bennett. They talked for a period of time, but Joseph doesn't remember this when he starts getting the letters from Bennett. He says in a letter that he sends back to Bennett, something to the effect of, you know, he hasn't had his, the, the pleasure of his acquaintance before that time. Mm -hmm. 
But when John C. Bennett starts writing to Joseph Smith, he's coming to this from a very interesting background. Um, Bennett had a variety of jobs and occupations before he became acquainted with Joseph Smith in 1840. He had been a preacher, as I mentioned, with Alexander Campbell. He'd also been a Methodist preacher before that time. Um, he had made efforts in Ohio and Indiana to establish universities in these areas. He unfortunately had some difficulty with establishing some universities because he tried to get one established in Ohio. The legislature of Ohio uh, was kind of waffling as to whether or not they wanted him to do it. He starts issuing degrees from this university, even though there's like no classes and no teaching going on at the university. If someone wanted a degree in uh, any one of a number of fields and was willing to pay for it, then it would issue them a degree. And so this comes to light. And so then the legislatures in Ohio and Indiana are pretty reluctant to let him start any other universities because sure. of this. He's also a great proponent of the tomato before he comes to Nauvoo in 1840. It's really interesting because at the time, this period of time, people didn't really consume tomatoes. There were some people that ate them, but a lot of people thought tomatoes were poisonous, and so they wouldn't eat them. But Bennett uh, had an acquaintance who was very pro-tomato, and Bennett became pro-tomato, and he wrote a whole bunch of uh, newspaper articles about the virtues of the tomato. Hmm. And he became actually fairly well-known uh, for his uh, tomato propaganda, I guess you, you could say. An advocate for the, the tomato. An advocate he, for the tomato. He's who I have to blame. That's right. And it's also interesting, too, because after... He, you know, becomes involved with the church and then falls away and becomes an enemy of Joseph Smith. He becomes a chicken breeder at that time, and he actually breeds a strain of chicken that becomes very well known as kind of the best uh, New England strain of chicken. So, I, I did not expect to be going this direction <laughs> in this episode, but that's that's a, that's a lot of food fascinating. connections. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's all to say that he has a whole variety of interests, and he's done a variety of things uh, before he comes to Nauvoo. He, yeah, and, go ahead. And, well, and my understanding is that he also is in the medical field. He is, yes. Or does that come later? No, you know, he is. He does have a uh, certificate that allows him to practice medicine. He was an apprentice to his uncle, Samuel Hildreth, who was a doctor, and then he I was able to obtain a certificate that uh, let him practice medicine. So yes, he also had a medical. And this is not well. a cer certificate from his <laughs> his uh, own university. No, it actually appears to be a legitimate okay. certificate. Okay. So, yeah. So he's writing letters to Joseph. He yeah. comes to Nauvoo. Yeah. So he, when he first starts writing to Joseph, I, I should mention too that he also he'd moved to Illinois, I think, in eighteen thirty eight or eighteen thirty nine, uh, one of those two years. And he formed an independent militia group in Illinois, um, and then he became the quartermaster general of the Illinois State Militia. And so he had that military kind of background as well. It's got quite the resume. It's quite, quite a resume. So he starts to write to Joseph, and he tells Joseph, uh, I feel so terrible about how you were treated in, in Missouri, how, how the saints were treated there. And if, if I had had it in my ability, I would have raised an armed force and we would have come to your rescue. Mm. And he writes probably four or five different letters to Joseph. They're, they're full of flattery, full of this, you know, kind of sympathy for what the saints have, have endured in Missouri. And you can imagine at the time, you know, with the treatment that the saints had in Missouri, um, all the opposition that, that was there, all the opposition that Joseph feels from people who had been close friends of his, uh, who had fallen away or had turned against him in Missouri, to have kind of a friendly voice and someone who was saying, oh, you know, you guys really did get a raw deal there, I'm sure was very kind of appealing to Joseph. Yeah. And so Bennett says, I'd love to come to Nauvoo and, and join join with you. And uh, Joseph says, yeah, come, come over. And so Bennett moves to Nauvoo in, I think, September of 1840. And he's baptized, becomes a member of the church. And then he has kind of this meteoric rise 
mm-hmm. um, in in the church. If if there is a fault that Joseph Smith had, or I mean, of course he has many faults, just like we all do. But one of them was sometimes he was a little too loyal to people that perhaps he should not have been. Mm-hmm. At other times, perhaps he wasn't the best judge of character of people, and uh, this this may have been an, an incident where Joseph maybe should have proceeded with a little more caution with mm-hmm. Bennett, since he really didn't know him very well. But Bennett becomes the mayor of Nauvoo. Uh, he is instrumental in getting the Nauvoo Charter passed through the Illinois legislature, because he's had experience in the past of kind of trying to get bills passed in state legislatures. He is also instrumental in setting up the Nauvoo Legion, again, drawing on his military background, and he becomes the second in command in the Nauvoo Legion. He's a major general and the inspector general of the Legion. And because Sidney Rigdon, um, one of Joseph's counselors in the first presidency, um, is ill at the time, Bennett's also appointed as an assistant president Mm. in the first presidency. So he quickly kind of rises uh, to fame and fortune in Nauvoo, he lives with Joseph Smith uh, for many months while he's in Nauvoo. And in, the, in the kind of hotel mansion house? Uh, I think this is before the mansion house was okay. built. I think the mansion house was finished in 1843. Okay. But he's living with Joseph and his family. Uh, so he's very well acquainted with, with Joseph and kind of becomes this rising star in Nauvoo. Hmm. So he gains this power. And then comes the controversy. He gets mixed up in some things that, that, uh, that's causing some strife among members and non-members. Maybe can we talk about this, this term called spiritual wifery and, and mm. how that's connected to John C. Bennett? Yeah, so let me preface it by uh, kind of saying this. So Joseph... Pretty early on after Bennett has arrived in Nauvoo, this is probably in early 1841, Joseph receives some communications from people saying, you need to kind of beware of Bennett. He's not who he's saying he is. Hmm. Um, Because Bennett had portrayed himself as a bachelor, you know, unmarried, single uh, person in Nauvoo. And Joseph finds out, no, he actually has a wife and two children. See now you said you said bachelor and now I'm thinking, you know this contestant is not here for the right reasons. <laughs> That's right. He 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 shouldn't get a rose. Exactly. Sure. So that would be alarming to Joseph to hear. Hey, this guy's got a family. Yes, it would be. It, it's interesting though because you know Joseph has been attacked throughout his prophetic career mm-hmm. up to this point. He's had accusations levied against him that aren't true, and so. Reflecting back on this time, Joseph says that he kind of filed this letter away, kept it in his mind, but he also wanted to give Bennett the benefit of the doubt. He didn't want to believe, oh, you know, this this guy's just a moral, without having moral reprobate. It. Yeah, without having it investigated. So uh, Joseph does send some people out. Uh, Hiram Smith and William Law go out to Ohio in 1841 to kind of see what's going on. And they report back, yeah, he, he does have, have a wife and children uh, back there. And uh, there's a few people there who say that he has not treated his wife well in the past, um, that he has been guilty of many adulterous affairs, that she finally left him because of these affairs but they were still married. She had not granted him a bill of divorcement when he, when he came to Illinois. So Joseph's hearing about all this, and then he starts hearing some alarming things about Bennett's conduct in Nauvoo. Hmm. And he hears that Bennett has been going around to some of the women in Nauvoo and has been telling them that Joseph Smith approves of promiscuous intercourse between the sexes. And he's saying this so that he can essentially sleep with these women, kind of using this ecclesiastical power and authority that he's portraying um, to be able to do this. So Joseph, in the summer of 1831, privately calls Bennett on the carpet. We have a, a letter that Joseph's nephew, Lorenzo Lawson, who was living with the Smiths at the time as well, uh, writes about how he said Joseph just... He, I think he terms it, he gave Bennett a severe flagellation 
Mm. Uh, kind of a verbal flagellation about his conduct and basically says, you need to stop doing this. You can't tell people that I approve of this and you shouldn't be telling people that, you know, this is uh, legitimate anyway. And so Bennett uh, says, I'm sorry, I'll stop. I won't, I won't do it again. But there are several other instances where Bennett and uh, some of his friends do go out and make these claims again. Now, I don't think they're saying at the time that Joseph is telling them that they can have spiritual wives. They're, they themselves are not going around to women and saying, you are my spiritual wife. They're not using that term for that. Okay. Later, when Bennett starts making accusations against Joseph Smith, he accuses Joseph Smith of the spiritual wifery doctrine that, uh, you know, Joseph has these spiritual wives, these plural wives. But Bennett's not referring to that with his own conduct. He basically is just going out and saying, hey, you know, we can have sex and Joseph's fine with it, so let's go. There's no commitment involved. Right. Just So he really has no term for what he's doing. He's right. just sleeping around, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Okay. So they continue this behavior after Joseph kind of reprimands him. What's the What's the next part of the story? Again, Joseph, you know, kind of privately reprimands Bennett a few different times. Bennett always promises that he'll uh, repent, that he'll stop, that he'll reform. In the early spring of 1842, Joseph sends George Miller um, again out to investigate some of these charges against Bennett. He again, he, he meets with Bennett's wife's brothers and talks to them so that there's kind of incontrovertible proof that Bennett is still married at the time. And Miller writes to Joseph about this. And it's around this time when Joseph gets the letter from Miller that uh, Joseph decides it's enough. We need to take action against Bennett. Uh, he doesn't mention Bennett by name, but he gives a very strong sermon in April of 1842 denouncing adulterers and uh, people who are immoral. And again, although he doesn't mention Bennett by name, you can tell that this is pretty much who, who he's referring to. Many of Bennett's friends who have been guilty of the same conduct are brought before the Nauvoo High Council in May of 1842, as well as some of the women who are involved with this. Um, to investigate what's going on. And so they are uh, disciplined by the Nauvoo High Council. But Bennett is, because of his position, I think, as an assistant president, as well as his kind of prominence in Nauvoo, is dealt with more by Joseph and by the Twelve Apostles. In a kind of a more private setting. Initially, yes, in a more private yeah. setting. So they prepare a... Notice of withdrawal of fellowship from Bennett on May 11th, 1842. It's signed by Joseph and by Hiram Smith, as well as by many of the 12 apostles. Um, not all of them, and not all of them are original signatures. So Willard Richards prepares the notice. There are some original signatures from the 12, but then Richards signs for a few of the other 12. And these appear to be members of the Twelve who had been in Nauvoo, but who had then left and weren't there at the time that the notice was prepared. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like Richards had probably talked to them. They approved of having their names appended to this uh, notice of withdrawal. So they have this, but it's not entirely clear what this notice means. We don't know if maybe it's saying, you know, Bennett, you're going to be cut off from the church, which was kind of the term that they used at the time for excommunicated, or whether it really was kind of more of what we would term today as a disfellowship, uh, mm -hmm. disfellowshipment of, of Bennett. Because six days after this notice is prepared, Joseph also authorizes Bennett to withdraw his name from the church voluntarily, mm -hmm. and Bennett agrees to do that. And so this seems to kind of be a way to let Bennett save face in leaving the church. Joseph also has Bennett come before the Nauvoo City Council and make a statement that uh, Joseph had never taught him about, uh, you know, that promiscuous intercourse was acceptable, which Bennett does. Bennett signs an affidavit uh, to this as well. And then something happens, and we're not sure what happens to precipitate this because it seems like Bennett's just going to go away peacefully from the church and leave Nauvoo. 
But then in June of 1842, Joseph has this notice of withdrawal of fellowship published, and he also denounces Bennett by name um, in a public setting. And this leads to Bennett getting quite angry and writing a series of letters uh, to the Sangamo Journal, Mm -hmm. denouncing Joseph Smith and saying, I'm the virtuous one here. Joseph Smith's the immoral one. Uh, He's guilty of, you know, the spiritual wifery doctrine. He has all these women that he's married. He has wives and concubines. And you should be focusing on him and and not on me. And and so that's where we get into some additional controversial stuff because there's a, a, a broader discussion about how much John C. Bennett would have known about plural marriage. Yes. Because Joseph is practicing, to some degree, plural marriage in Nauvoo. And, you know, you've got John C. Bennett living at Joseph's house for a while. So I guess my question is, was he in the know on this? It's a great question. It's one that historians have debated quite a bit over the years. And so you have different historians that will say, yes, he definitely knew about it. He was an insider. He had, you know, Joseph had talked to him about it. You have other historians who say, uh, no, he probably knew something about it. But uh, we don't think Joseph actually ever taught him the doctrine of of plural marriage. Um, I think I probably fall more in the latter category of this. Uh, Bennett certainly knew something about plural marriage because in his uh, anti-Joseph Smith book, History of the Saints, uh, he names several women um, as plural wives of Joseph, and they really were plural wives of Joseph at, at the time. So he clearly knows something about it. But he also portrays plural marriage in such a lurid and sensational way that he either is just blowing it all out of proportion or he didn't have a great understanding of what plural marriage was. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, too, if Joseph knows Bennett has all this immorality going on at the time, why would he teach him about plural marriage? Mm -hmm. Um, And And he he found out about that immorality relatively quickly after Bennett arrived. Yeah, so either Joseph taught it to him within weeks of Bennett coming to Nauvoo, which I don't think is too likely, or else Bennett heard about it from other people, may have heard about it a little bit from Joseph, but didn't have a complete understanding of it. Mm. Interesting. So maybe we can shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about um, Sarah Pratt, I Mm -hmm. believe is her name. Yes. Uh, This is, maybe tell us a little bit about Bennett's relationship with Sarah? It depends on who you ask. Okay. (laughs) If you ask Joseph Smith and some others in Nauvoo, they say that Sarah and John C. Bennett had an adulterous relationship while Orson Pratt was in England uh, preaching the gospel there. Bennett himself denied this and said essentially they were just friends, that there was nothing that went on between them. I've seen some documents they're pretty graphic about kind of some of what these witnesses are saying that they have yeah. seen between the two of them. I'm trying to dance around it a little bit, you guys. But from what I recall, we have people saying, hey, I walked in on them, right. essentially. Yeah. Does Bennett have a defense for that? He's, you know, his, his defense is people will do whatever Joseph Smith tells them to do. Joseph told them to swear to these affidavits saying that they saw us doing this. Mm-hmm. It's not true. Um, they're lying about it. That's essentially what his defense is. So it's, it essentially comes down to Bennett's word against Joseph's. Yes. And that's the way it is for, for a lot of this, which can be frustrating. Yeah. Both yeah. as a historian and, you know, as a member of the church trying to figure out what's going on here, uh, because it essentially is a he said, he said yeah. thing in, in many ways. So Sarah ends up leaving the church, right? Is that... Or no, uh, eventually, no, no, she, eventually, but eventually, not at this but time. Not at this time. So, um, what goes on as far as her relationship with Joseph and the saints in the midst of all this controversy? Bennett kind of counterclaims, uh, or he actually makes the assertion first, and then Joseph says, "No, you know, it's Bennett and Sarah that had the relationship." But Bennett says that Joseph proposed marriage to Sarah while Orson was in England. That. Uh, He tried to make Sarah one of his plural wives Mm -hmm. at that time. And when Orson gets back from England and hears about this, it creates some friction in his relationship with Joseph. And for a time, uh, Orson is dropped from the Quorum of the Twelve for several months. 
He comes back in 1843 and essentially Joseph, you know, denies everything that Bennett's been saying about uh, Joseph and Sarah uh, repeatedly. And Orson accepts that and comes back and is reinstated as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve in 1843. So Sarah eventually becomes quite uh, antagonistic towards the church. Um, and she makes some claims, and, and this may again be one of those, you know, you've got to decide whose word you're going to believe on this. But she claims that John C. Bennett is actually performing abortions in Nauvoo, that he has the instruments and the know-how to do it, that he's been doing it, and that he uh, has performed abortions for women that Joseph Smith has been with. Is there any truth to that? What what information do we have about that claim? Yeah, so this claim that Sarah makes comes out in a book that a man named Wilhelm Weil publishes in Utah in the 1880s, I think. Um, it's an attempt to expose Joseph as a fraud, the church as a fraud. And so he has a statement in there from Sarah Pratt where she talks about Bennett performing abortions uh, for Joseph Smith. One of the interesting things is, in terms of the contemporary records, so, you know, the records in 1842, you don't have any records or any accusations of this happening um, mm. in terms of Bennett performing abortions on women who Joseph Smith uh, got pregnant. Mm. What you do have in the contemporary record is you have two affidavits, one that Hiram Smith gave and one that a woman named uh, Zeruiha Goddard gave that say that Bennett did p perform abortions, but they were for women who Bennett and his friends had slept with. Mm, the and plot not, thickens. Yeah, and not Joseph Smith. And it seems to me, with all the accusations that Bennett makes against Joseph, which are many <laughs> uh, in his book, History of the Saints, and in the letters that he writes to the Sangamo Journal, he never says, Joseph had me perform abortions on women. And I would think that this would be something Bennett would put in his book if indeed yeah. he had done that, because it would then kind of bolster his claim that Joseph is this immoral person yeah. who's sleeping around, getting all kinds of women pregnant, and then he has to go in and kind of clean up the mess behind it. Yeah, it, it's it's suspicious that a, a piece of ammunition that lethal against Joseph would be withheld right in the middle of that controversy in 1842. Yes. Yeah. And it doesn't show up for another 40 years. Yes. Hmm. But essentially, we're left to kind of decide who we're, who we're going to believe, unfortunately. Yeah, essentially, it's another one of those things where... Can't prove it either can't way. Can't prove it either way. But yeah. definitely some uh, something fishy going on there with that late account. But yeah, that's helpful information. Yeah. So how does this controversy with John C. Bennett kind of simmer, simmer down? Kind of what's the result of it? Well, it doesn't simmer down for a while. Okay. Uh, Bennett keeps it alive. Uh, so he publishes these four letters in the Sangamo Journal in the summer of 1842. He then compiles the letters together, together with material that Eber D. Howe had published in his expose of the church, Mormonism Unveiled, and other information. Uh, that's published as a book in the fall of 1842 called The History of the Saints. And then Bennett also goes on the lecture circuit, and he travels around the eastern United States. People pay to come and hear him talk about all of his accusations against Joseph Smith, kind of his unveiling of all the lurid dealings of the saints in, in Nauvoo. And this happens for uh, many months that Bennett's doing this. And Johnny Page, who is one of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who's serving a mission in Pennsylvania at the time, he writes Joseph a letter and he says, hey, we need to take some action because all these claims that Bennett are making, they're having an effect on mm. people and you need to take some action. And so uh, several men are called on missions specifically to go back east and to refute the accusations that Bennett has been making against Joseph Smith. But I think in some ways, too, just personally, I look at Bennett and I think his legacy extends even to today because... Tomatoes. Tomatoes for one thing, chickens for another. Yeah. But even more than that, he's really kind of the first one to expose 
plural marriage, even though it's an exaggerated version of plural marriage, he kind of exposes that in 1842. And the way that he presents it with all of these, you know, he, he says Joseph has all of these wives and concubines that he calls the Mormon seraglio. And he says there's different levels within this. Like, none of this is corroborated by any other evidence, uh, mm-hmm. both, you know, from people at the time, from women who were in uh, plural marriages with Joseph Smith. There's nothing he, like he what He promotes Bennett it says. as this huge organized entity yes. that's going on underground. And, and my understanding is that at this time in 18... 18- 41, 1842, Joseph didn't even have very many plural wives at that time. Is that correct? The, there were a few, um, not as many as, as he would have. He, he marries women uh, throughout 1842 and 1843 um, as plural wives. So there, there certainly are uh, some mm-hmm. at the time. And again, Bennett knows about uh, several of them. But I think the way that Bennett portrays plural marriage to the world kind of has colored the way that critics of the church or people in the church kind of investigating this still kind of look at it like this Mm. really bizarre, immoral, uh, sensationalist practice. And I'm not sure Joseph Smith, had he talked much about plural marriage or left records behind it, certainly his version of plural marriage would be vastly different from John C. Bennett's. Yeah. Um, but I think that legacy of how Bennett portrays it has continued over time. He just really illustrated it in a quite imaginative way. Yes. And, and we're still seeing some vestiges of that. Yeah. For people who are just learning about this stuff, this mm-hmm. is, I mean, this is, this is pretty raw history. What advice would you have for members of the church um, or people learning about the church? What advice would you have for them as they encounter this kind of tough history? What, what kind of approach would you suggest? Yeah, I think it's important to have the context behind everything. Um, specifically when you're de- dealing with John C. Bennett, I think it's important to note that he had a reputation before he ever became affiliated with the church of dishonesty and deception in some ways. There's this uh, peddling of the diplomas that we talked about. Uh, There are other people who say, yeah, he wasn't a great person. He just tried to promote his own advantage in whatever way he believed he needed to. And you see this after he leaves the church too. He actually, this is interesting too. So after Joseph Smith is killed, and James Strang is one of the people who uh, come along and say that he's the successor to Joseph Smith, and there are several Latter-day Saints who follow James Strang. Bennett becomes affiliated with Strang's movement. Really? But then he's ejected just a few months after under a cloud of controversy again. And so when you see these things and you kind of see what Bennett was like before, what he's like after, I think you need to really question much of what Bennett says. Yeah. And I think it's the way with a lot of the things that we see about Joseph Smith, oftentimes there's a kernel of truth to it, Mm -hmm. but then it's distorted and depicted in ways that make it seem just crazy and odd and unacceptable. And I think you may see this with Bennett as well, that he may have had a kernel of truth in some of the things he was talking about, but he distorts it in a way, and he does it because he's he wants to bring Joseph Smith down. That's his stated goal. Yeah. And so I think you need to take into consideration his motives as well. And so having that context, kind of looking at his motives, looking at, you know, what evidence is corroborated and by whom. And then in some ways with this, you have to kind of choose who you're going to side with. You know, personally for me, I believe Joseph Smith was a prophet, and so I don't believe that he's lying about a lot of this stuff. I I tend to believe his side more than I believe Bennett's side, yeah. um, and I think that's something that, that you just need to make a choice about. So if people want to learn more about this, what resources are available? So a lot of the documents surrounding Bennett are in uh, Documents Volume 10 of the Joseph Smith Papers. Um, They're all available on our website, josephsmithpapers.org. There have been quite a bit of scholarship done on Bennett. I published an article in Mormon Historical Studies on Bennett. There's a biography of John C. Bennett that Andrew Smith wrote um, that's that's a, a, a good piece of work. 
And there are articles, I know Brian Hales has talked about John C. Bennett and kind of the plural marriage aspect of it. Um, Mormon Polygamy Documents, I think, is yes. the website. And he's got a whole thing on Sarah Pratt and John C. Bennett. That's yeah. a good resource if you're wanting to learn more about that. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's there's various resources you can, you can turn to. Even Saints, Volume 1, talks about John C. Bennett. Mm. And so I would, I would put that as a good source to go to as well. Awesome. Matt, thank you so much for being here. Everybody watching, thank you for listening, and have a great day.